Yeah. In our studio, we have with us my good friend, uh, J.R. Clark from Squire, Patton, and Boggs, as well as uh, my good friend, uh, Chris Randolph, of course, married Chris Randolph. Uh, welcome yes. back to the studio. JR, I want to start off with you because sure. I know uh, last year or even before then, uh, you have always been at the, at the front and center of supporting uh, Senator Harris. I mean, you were early on. And I remember mm -hmm. early on back in, I think, <laughs> 03 or 04, uh, well, actually, 03 or 02, there was a small group of people in Washington, D.C., and I think you were in that room where we went to some little apartment or something on Capitol Hill, and and then Senator Barack Obama was in that mm -hmm, little yep. room. Do you remember that? I and, do. On Mass Avenue, I do remember that. Yes. Oh, Mass Avenue, absolutely, absolutely. And it was early, 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 early on, right? When people didn't even know, you know, whether he was running or whatever, but it was a small group uh, of African-Americans uh, in that room, young folks uh, mm -hmm. who was there to show their support. And you have done the same thing early on with Senator Harris. What about Senator Harris gave you that same uh, energy, that same um, understanding that she was ready to take the position that she has now? Yeah, um, thanks. It really is a pleasure being here. Um, and, and it's a great question, too, because similar to um, at the time, then Senator um, Obama, when we were in that room, um, what, what, what struck me about then Senator Obama was the journey he took, um, the journey that, that he spoke to in, in meeting him, uh, that journey that he had an opportunity, or at least at that point had, in Chicago, he had been a um, community organizer. And he is someone who had, as an attorney, had an opportunity to study the law and then apply that um, to challenging situations for, that he saw in Chicago to organizing and uh, being an advocate for the rights um, of those without a voice, or at least voice who hadn't been heard. Similarly with um, Senator Harris, I actually had a chance to meet her, uh, it's been about five years ago now. And at the time she was the AG, the Attorney General for California had been, at that point, had entered the race or was looking to enter the race um, for, for the Senate. Um, and meeting her, what struck me about her was her journey, um, her um, the way she spoke to issues that I found important, uh, we shared, I think, the um, same concerns. I, I found that uh, the, the the issue that she spoke to, um, those incarcerated, um, those who housing issues, um, issues affecting those that, um, again, similar to what I mentioned about um, Senator Obama, those whose voice perhaps hadn't been heard. So when she spoke to that, um, it struck me. That drew, that drew my attention. Also to the environment. The environment that you spoke to, um, with uh, when we met with uh, Senator Obama many years ago, when we looked around that room, those are people that I think you and I can can say for folks who had been in the trenches for so long. When I met with um, um, Senator Harris for the first time in the room when I first met her, um, I was there with some of our frat brothers, and there were a bunch of folks from Howard University there. It struck me the love, the um, the attention, um, the the outpouring that um, was in the room, um, the love in that room for her and her response to that. That struck me. Those are sort of the intangibles that one may not always be able to, um, to see, but that at least drew me in to um, probe more to just, you know, and enter into conversations with her. It led me to really jumping on board with her at that time. Well, I will say this. I mean, uh, you uh, you picked the winner. You was there early. It was a group of us sitting in that room uh, early, 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 early. It's kind of funny because I just thought about it. Like I hadn't even mentioned it in years, but it just hit me. <laughs> That uh, be in that room, and then here you go again with uh, with uh, Senator Harris, uh, Chris. I mean, look, Chris. You and I, we've talked. You've mentioned on several times. Um, what are your thoughts about what took place? Because you kind of tried to look. You kind of called this a little bit. Well, um, one of the things that is phenomenal, and I hear a lot of people talking about the great aspect of Senator Harris and how warm she is. Uh, Andrew Yang, her opponent in the Democratic race, had an interview this morning, and he talked about the fact that she was one of the nicest people to him before he was anybody to be nice to. And, and of the 20 candidates that were running, um, a lot of people were transactional, but she was actually very warm to him. And that's a great piece that we're going to, to that is great for, you can't bottle that, you can't sell that. But what I looked at is that she was phenomenal on paper. And it's really, really, really a wonderful moment in history that people are describing 
the African American slash Indian woman as the safe choice. We don't get to be that. We that's being African American in itself is radical, and the fact that she was considered of eleven great and um, phenomenal women who were also up for this position, the best of the best. That is amazing, and you can quantify it. It was it was something that no one could argue. Uh, when Senator Harris introduced last year um, to run in a primary, 22,000 people showed up. When she did her town hall, she had the highest rated town hall of any candidate. Um, she had struggles with her campaigns, but most people kind of put that out as she hired a few people that she couldn't fire. I mean, it, it was not the best run campaign, but it wasn't a matter that she couldn't bottle energy and that, sh that she didn't have something that is of value and able to nurture. So with such a good candidate on the scene, it was hard to see where anyone else could take her on. I looked at Susan Rice, who I actually personally very like a lot, but it's going to be hard for somebody to say that the number two person from the a man who's going to be 77 years old when he's 78 years when he takes the office should be someone who's never run once for not even city council member. Right. Uh, and uh, Karen Bass, I love Karen Bass. I actually do not think the vetting process did her justice. They threw her into last minute. But I knew when I was looking at her profile, I was like, she's not going to pass a vet. And it didn't turn out as well as we were looking. So looking at the actual 11 candidates on paper, the only other person I could possibly see that would have been just as valuable to Joe Biden would have been Gretchen Whitmer. Um, and I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for that, but the only other person could have been, and Gretchen took herself out. Of all, um, uh, all reports is Gretchen did not want to be considered. And she, she saw, according to this um, report, she saw what we all saw. It was time for a black woman. So, uh, so, um, to JR, you, you've been following and you've been a supporter of uh, <laughs> Senator Harris. Um, walk me through, because you also are a partner at a major law firm in the District mm -hmm. of Columbia. Clearly, you're an African American. And what happens and what's taking place in some of the areas of the black community uh, is some reservations about of her and what she did as a prosecutor and as an attorney. Um, mm -hmm. Can you kind of walk one through how one could be a prosecutor? Because clearly we want people to be prosecutors. We clearly need more African-American prosecutors in the, in the system, right? Because right. it is a such thing as having, you know, someone of color actually be a prosecutor, right? That's right. what people right. wanted a long time ago. She stepped on the table. She's done that. And when you do that, clearly you prosecute people. And sometimes those people that you prosecute tend to be more of people of a color. Walk us through the thought process as an attorney, as someone who supports her, and why you are supporting her, even given the fact that there are some who believes that what she has done and who she has prosecuted has been on the backs of people of color. Yeah, I think there are, there, there are a number of factors to consider. Um, you know, it's, it's, there, there's a lot to it. First of all, look, understanding the person, who she is, uh, her story, um, Kamala is her parents who met as PhD candidates in Berkeley in the 60s. Um, they met through the, through the civil rights movement. So she is really a litter. She is actually a child born of that period. In fact, she, um, as a baby, um, was there with her parents as they um, participated in the 60s, in the mid to late 60s. Civil well, rights let, but let me, let me ask you a question, Jill, because clearly I think her parents came to the United States in 1958. Mm-hmm. Right? right. And so, and, right. And, right. And then they got right. involved with the movement. So that's what you were saying, because I know someone's going to say, they don't tweet me. Oh, you know, our parents just got here 1958. Well, it doesn't make a difference. They got here and they got involved in the civil rights and they got involved in the struggle. And she was a baby when that happened. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah, you, but I, that, that, people start tweeting I mean, early and I want to tweet back and let them know. Yeah. Let, and, let her, and, let, and that person, too, ought to know that. Um, civil rights is an exclusively um, an issue here in the United States because her mother, and coming from India, her grandparents were involved in the civil rights movements of India prior to her mother actually getting here. So that was actually in her blood. It was in her blood through her parents. 
Um, and obviously there are challenges even in Jamaica. So that her parents were here as students, that sort of, she grew up, she was incubated in that environment. And when she became a prosecutor after graduating from high school, I mean, high school, after graduating from law school, went too far back. But after her own law school, she became a part of the DA's office. And later on, in becoming the district attorney um, in, um, in San Francisco, it was done intentionally. I mean, there were other options that she could have pursued, but her approach was there were challenges and problems with the system. And in order to correct or address some of those challenges, um, she uh, embarked on um, being in, being engaged in a way that perhaps um, would lead to change. Now, one of the, as as now there, one of the challenges I think that she encountered and that we must learn to appreciate is that the department that she's run, be it the DA's office in San Francisco, and later on as the Attorney General for um, for um, California, the largest state. Which, by the way, the attorney the, the Attorney General's office of California is the second largest um, law firm, if you will, after the Department of Justice. In the nation um and within a department of the either the da's office or the attorney general's office um there's there's a lot going on underneath you. um and are there are the elements of, of of either of those situations that perhaps could have been handled differently perhaps but in a large when you have large um organizations like that um everything perhaps can't be done as you would hope they would be done. so it we can now i don't want to say isolate but there are definitely areas that one can focus on where there may have been shortcomings or things could have been done differently looking back in hindsight. Um, but the bottom line is that I think that in looking at the totality of her experiences there, the, her leadership there, she did a great job in terms of moving the ball forward. Right? Um, and again, in terms of reconciling challenges that our community may have, that I have, that you may have, that any of us, that Chris may have, with respect to our prosecutors, you're right. There's There are some good prosecutors, there are bad prosecutors, you know, and there are well-intentioned prosecutors, um, there are prosecutors who really don't take the job serious or perhaps are using it as a stepping stone. I, I think, again, looking at the totality of, of Kamala's experiences, both in the, as the DA and later on as the attorney general, she did a great job of moving the ball forward. Um, as we all can appreciate having been involved in politics um, and you Kwame has been an elected official, is that you're always going to have your naysayers. They're always going to have those whose job is seen sometimes is to pick through your record. Um, and to find the shortcomings in which you uh, sought to accomplish or and sometimes overlooking what you may have in fact accomplished. So look, so the thing that really I love, I really appreciate about her is she went head on intentionally seeking out those roles as the um, district attorney uh, for San Francisco and later on as the attorney general um, well, with, the, with the hopes of correcting. Right. There. And and let me be clear. Uh, it's everyone says, well, you know, it was this, it was that. I mean, damn, I, I have some stuff in, that I would do differently, too, right? If they say, mm -hmm. hey, man, I got some stuff that I agree, disagree with, some stuff that I disagree with about me, right? Everyone, right. we all have that, right? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, I think what I'm seeing, and, and Chris, I'll have you jump in on this, mm -hmm. is that people, uh, some people wanted other candidates, whether they wanted the mayor of Atlanta, whether they wanted... Uh, the congressman of Florida, no matter who it is, they they want and they didn't get it, and that's what happens. And then the party comes kind of comes together uh, to move the ball uh, forward. The number one objective for Democrats is to beat uh, the Republicans and to take back the White House. And clearly, there are going to be some things about. There's a lot of stuff about Trump that the Democrats say, "Hey, it's it's time for someone else." There are a lot of things about. Uh, Vice President Pence that people disagree with that doesn't think that he should be the, the vice president. There's a lot of things about Joe Biden, all the all the you know the bumbling that he's kind of done that says, hey, we have an issue with that. There's no perfect candidate. There's no perfect person. There's flaws in all of us. Uh, the question becomes, how can the party rally behind uh, the the ticket that we currently have, and how? And I think this is an important question that I have for you, Chris. It has to be okay for people to say negative stuff about whoever the Democratic uh, president, presidential nominee is and vice president. It, it has to be a healthy discussion. It's okay to point out some flaws but still vote, right? And I think that what you have, if someone says anything bad or wrong or factual and shouldn't say it, everyone jumps on uh, those individuals and what happens is then you know they become isolated and then you have a party that's not together. Right. It's OK to say that I, I can't jump high. I can't. You can tell me, don't pick me on the basketball team. And if you do, you can be mad at them for picking me because I can't jump. I'm not going to play no defense 
right? I'm an offensive guy, right? All I want to do is shoot the ball. I don't want to go back and forth. I want to shoot the ball. And you can criticize me for that, and it's okay as long as you know I'm going to be able to help the team win by scoring. And that's the kind of point I wanted to, to kind of bring out. Um, what do you think the ability for the Democratic Party to move in that direction quickly? Well, we are down to 82 days. It's only 82 days, and we're down to a lot less because people keep looking at Election Day as November 3rd. But this isn't 2008. This is not even 2016. Election Day moves up and up each year, and actually we want that. So eight states will start voting at September 15th. And this is when the Democratic Party moves from trying to hear people, so we can be a little bit abrupt now, to kind of mobilizing our troops. We're trying to get in gear, get our vote out, um, get people to vote and log it in so we can change, we can get Donald Trump out of here, we can get uh, Speaker Pelosi to stay Speaker, and when we can take back the Senate. We have the best con a candidate in Kamala Harris. Um, this morning, you could see that the Republicans are scrambling to find and figure out what will work against her. They're trying to say she's too soft, she's too hard. They're doing it all at once. And in many places, I say her, prosecut her prosecutorial experience is an asset. Um, people look at trying to swift vote Kamala Harris. She was, she was one of the people who started back on track, which was one of the places that you put wraparound services in order to address crime. We were doing just before it was justice and policing. She was doing reform of policing way back in 2015. So this is now part of the national stage. She can take on those issues. She, can she did COVID bills back in February before people we had, before our commander in chief was even paying attention to that issue. We have the best person to, to move forward with it. So right now we're for the last couple of days we're getting more serious we're looking for people to kind of join us to do phone banking to do calls to do legal protection jr and to get really um out there and start to make the case make our closing arguments for a new america well chris let me ask you a question why are there still uh, and clearly you know uh, bakari sellers i know that uh, my good friend um JR, you know Bakari very well also. And when we started to, I had him on a show and he, you know, he basically said, look, he said this, I am, you know, when it comes to a black woman, if they're equally qualified or just as qualified, he's supporting the black woman, period. Mm -hmm. And why, Chris, are there still some that out there that are black women that, you know, are not supporting this candidate? this vice presidential uh, nominee? Well, just, just to be clear, and I know they are, but just to be clear, we have about 90% um, of unity. So they, we, we t tested people who, are, who supported Bernie Sanders, who supported Elizabeth Warren. We have about 90%. In the past, we usually like 85%. 80, in, in, 19, in 2016, it was lower, it was about, around 82, 87, 83. In... 2008, going from Hillary to President Obama, it was around 85. Right now, we're at 90%. So, but there is not perfect. And obviously, we would still want to reach out to those who are not considering voting for us, because just because we have possibly a winning strategy with the 90%, that doesn't mean the voices of those who are not feeling included shouldn't be at the t shouldn't be called up upon and shouldn't be brought to the table. Well, I'm just going to say you got you got I don't know how any uh, woman of color uh, is not supporting uh, uh, Senator Harris. Now, it could be for, you know, some personal reason that we don't know. Right. There's always a reason. I'm not saying it's the right reason, but it could be a reason. I want to ask uh, Jr. back to you when it comes to the African-American male. You know, there are some out there that believe that the African-American male are, are not likely, like it'll be a larger percentage that would not support uh, Senator Harris than it is for the African-American female, right? Most people say 97% of African-American women are going to support, <laughs> or maybe, you know, higher than that, uh, uh, Senator Harris. But when it comes to African-American men, and we see it on the internet, we see it on social media, we see there's some out there that, you know, have, have lost their way. 
for some reason they you know they're they're mad about something and i don't know <clears throat> given the alternative that they have i don't know how they could not be supportive of her what, what do you think that she needs to do what do you think the party needs to do uh to wrap their hands around making sure that there's no slippage but gainage for african-american men yeah i think that part of the message has to be out and i, I, I your point is well taken too it's um voting politics is a, it's a relative assessment whatever your issues may be with senator harris or the ticket joe biden's the top of the ticket she's the vice president elections voting is it's a it's a relative um decision um considering the alternative donald trump why would you vote for the biden um, Harris tickets. So I just, I don't, I don't, so I, I, I have difficulty understanding why anyone, whatever your hesitation may be, but the Democratic ticket here, um, how, how you would not cast your ballot um, for the Democratic ticket, um, whatever your differences may be. Um, I think though, in terms of, 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 of black men um, coming out and being supportive or voting in this next election, it's, it's a unique moment. It's a, and we, we say that so often, these unique moments, but this especially is considering what we have in the White House right now in terms of the assault upon civil rights, all rights, so many different rights, um, where we where this President Trump has positioned our community, the black community, and where America has suffered under um, Donald Trump's, um, under, under the Trump administration. It's really important, especially urgent for everyone, and especially um, black people, black men, um, part of that, to, um, to come have their voices heard. Right now, I think there's great momentum in terms of what we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I think there, we have an opportunity now to convert some of that energy, um, some of the, the feelings that are expressed in the streets, have that energy um, converted into actual policy changes, changes that, um, affect, that will affect each of us, each of our households. Um, at least there's that opportunity. There's a greater promise now. As we call it, appreciate, um, nothing's ever perfect, but in terms of coming closer to the realization of that hope, I think that we're there now if we can get the right players at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with the right administration. And it goes up and down the ticket with respect to the White House, along with um, various um, senators. If we can get the Senate back, if the Senate can flip um, and, and we can, um, make some gains there, um, I think that we have an opportunity now, like I said, to um, convert some of the energy and some of the um, the warm feelings that Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement has um, has, has produced, and have that converted into real power, okay. policy, tangible, real things that we have in our lives. No, I think I, a lot and, of and, and I and I hear you. I want to. I think it's important to say this. And Chris, I'm going to bring you in in a second. Um, I, I want to be clear. It's still a democracy. Sure. And I know that you know Kanye West is, uh, you know, running, not running, whatever he's doing. Um, there's so much attention than hate is going to him for actually running. And I believe in a democracy. Anybody who wants to run should be able to run. I think that people should be able to um, kind of lay out the importance of voting a certain way if they want to take back the White House. And you make your argument and people make their choice, right? If people are voting for Kanye West, they're voting for a reason. And they might be voting because they don't know any better. And I think we isolate people who might say, I'm voting for Kanye West as opposed to educate people, right? right. And educating them what the importance of this election is. Chris, tell me your, your, your I, I knew you were waiting to jump in here. Uh, you know, walk me, you did, Walk me through. I mean, that's where I am, right? I, I, we spend so much time on Kanye as opposed to talking about the importance of the next four years, the importance of the next eight years. And we get caught up in isolating and turning off young folks when we're talking about an individual that has mental illness. Mm -hmm. So there's two, two pieces to that. Um, for one, I think we should bring everyone along for whether they have value to us electorally or not. I mean, we're in the last 82 days of this election. We want to win. There are going to be some people who are very difficult to get to. Younger voters are hard to cultivate. And there's, it, they take about 14 different touches in contacts to make sure that they vote. And you have to spend more money and more dollars to develop them as voters. That doesn't mean it's not worth it. All right. So we so we're talking about people it takes more work to cultivate people like your daughters and your sons to become voters. And 
that's where we need to spend the money. But as we're into 82 days, I'll be honest with you, as a campaign staffer, you're going to target those people who always vote, who always come out and make sure you bank those votes. So we're not having great conversations with people who need to come into the process. We're not having uh, great conversations for the 40% of voters who don't, the 40% of eligible people who don't show up to vote. And that's where the Kanye's of the world are speaking to. Um, and that's who the Trump campaign, now this is my little piece of salt for it, because I would be like, yeah, go for it, Kanye. You have a platform, you can go in just like everybody else, but we're looking on Twitter and we're seeing in reports, he's meeting with Jared Kushner every day. So it's not like it's a, it's not an exercise in democracy, but a farce. In, in that in that sense and then in that way you get incensed if you're really doing it to undermine and to be strategic uh, to pull black voters away of course i'm gonna have an issue with that but normally i'd be like go for it uh, mr west take take on uh this system show that anybody can run and be part of it but i i, I what i'm seeing i'm feeling a little nervous that he doesn't take it seriously and that's my concern JR, what, do you, what is your thoughts on that? I, I, too, I too feel the same, I, I, a similar vein as to what's being expressed by, by you and, and Chris. I think that, um, I think everyone, you know, democracy, in a democracy, um, everyone, you know, if you're meeting whatever the criteria may be, age and, and so forth, I welcome anyone or encourage anyone to participate um, in the electoral process. I think, though, that a couple of issues are, um, strike me now. The, the urgency of the moment, where the country is um, domestically and internationally, where, where the country sits right now, we're at a serious, we're at a serious point um, in, in in terms of where this country sits. So therefore, I, I think every election has to be taken seriously. I think especially now, um, it, it's an, important to consider how you use your vote. And just the same for those who are entering into or participating, like if Kanye West is, is, is looking to actually do this or if it continues to move forward, I think he needs to, and I, I think you're right, clearly there's some issues of that, that need to be addressed with him, but there's a responsibility both on those casting the vote, or those who are choosing or attempting to participate in an election. You know, what, and you have to assess, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with perhaps there's an issue you're looking to advance in participating um, in, in an election. That's fair. I mean, you don't have to necessarily want to run or be in a race in order to necessarily win if you're looking to advance particular uh, position, that's fine. I think you have to assess too, what harm perhaps would do you bring um, in drawing votes from others? So there has to be that sort of consideration. I think there's a responsibility again on all those involved when it comes to elections. And I'm just not, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that in some in some places, in some corners perhaps, um, this distraction uh, may be harmful. Um, and I, I don't think that where we are as a country, I don't think that uh, we have any, um, any, any corner can be open. That's all. Well, let me just say, you know, as we're looking at a couple, two generational folks that's on the show today with Jr. and Chris, you know, how do we, how does the party move forward? How does the party now continue? It looks like the energy is there. It looks like the momentum is there. It looks like the fundraising is gone. You know, they've we raised an incredible amount of money in the last, what, 24 hours. Um, Chris, you've laid out that the, the certain polls have shown a, a shift. Uh, to 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 Biden and to Harris, um, the question is, you know, can that sustain itself over the next, you know, couple of thirty days or sixty days? Uh, Chris, what is your prediction on the election? Well, I'm going to predict we win, and and so there's a little bit of bias there, but I feel a little more comfortable predicting, making this prediction. If you had asked me four years ago on air, do, do I think we were going to win? I probably would have still said yes, but I behind the scenes, I would have said, look, the polls are a little closed. I'm a little nervous about our battleground states. We have, so we're still staying within the margin of error. We have this large contingent of um, uh, undecided. We don't have that this year. We have, we have 270 electoral votes that are above the 9% or 10% polling average. So we have large amount of states that have wide polling um, advantages. We get to actually expand the map going into Texas and Georgia 
even if we don't win this year, we get to play. And that is that is that breeds a lot of confidence. We get well, to be competitive in North Carolina, which we don't necessarily need to win, but that is for the future of the party, not necessarily just winning now. And if we could repudiate Donald Trump, not just beat him by 270, but get up to 300 and 340 and tell the world that this is not our politics, this is not our country, that is something that we should all be striving for. And I think we can get there. The numbers look good. The, the, the battleground polls, the, the fundraising, where we are getting volunteers, all of it is very indicative of a possible big win on November 3rd or no. November, depending okay. on what. Well, no, no, thanks. Well, no, absolutely. Always appreciate the advice that you bring to the table. Uh, JR, I mean, you have been there day one uh, with uh, Senator Harris. Uh, what, is, what is your prediction on whether we will see a vice president Harris? Um, I, I, believe, I, I believe that um, I believe America um, has hopefully awoken at this point. I think, um, I think so. And I, 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 I'm, I'm anticipating, hoping for an in vision of victory for, uh, for, for the Biden-Harris ticket. I really do. Um, I think, though, Chris is right. I think that we this more than a win, we have to run through the tape. I think that the, the hope, for me at least, I think for a number of people, is to uh, reduce the or have the Trump uh, four years be, have been an aberration in terms of um, American politics, um, an experiment that perhaps people were frustrated in 2016. Perhaps there were a lot of assumptions in 2016, but I think that um, I think that Donald Trump has scared a lot of people into now coming out and wanting to vote. And I think he realized that, and that's why there's so much effort uh, by his Department of Justice to suppress um, um, suppress um, the vote in so many um, parts of the country. I, I don't know if we're going to get a 49 to 1, you know, Reagan, Carter sort of thing, but I think that I would love to see, and I believe we will see, uh, um, a rather significant uh, popular vote disparity between um, between the um, in this race between Trump and, and, and Biden. I th I think that um, there was more so than the three million gap that we saw in 2016 between Hillary and Trump. I think so. I think that, uh, but I do see, um, as, as Chris indicated, I see definitely the 300 um, the electoral college returns for the Democratic uh, ticket. You know? Right. Well, look, I'm going to say this. It's no way because it's always real talk. So I got to keep it real. It's just when, when it comes down to when I start to uh, let me get everybody on here. So when I it comes down to this. Here you go, here you have, in the United States of America, lots of energy. I mean, the company from an economic standpoint is, 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 is gonna be hurting even more, and we all know it, right? Mm -hmm. We know that we have a, a, a virus that we haven't wrapped our hands around while schools are closed and colleges are closed and restaurants are closed and malls are pretty much going out of business. I mean, you have a president with approval rating that is the lowest that we've seen. Um, you have a hate that's on on that's and and want to get rid of uh, and move in a different direction. And still we have Democrats. They're like, yeah, I think we're going to pull it off. I uh, hope we squeak if everyone gets out the vote. I mean, that's what makes me kind of look back and say, whoa, you know, when if, if under normal circumstances, this should be a blowout. It should just be a complete blowout. Right. And uh, we should be winning everywhere, given that what's taking place and going on in the country. But there's a, you know, everyone's kind of taking a pause by this. I don't know if it was because of 2016 and they saw what happened when they got excited and thought or people just aren't telling the truth. They're talking to posters and that not telling the truth. There's a lot of people out there who support the president. But I guarantee if you call them and ask them you support the president, they're going to say no. Right. Mm -hmm. No one wants to openly be out here supporting uh, any of the Republicans that are not a Republican right now. If they're moderate, <laughs> they're never going to tell you, oh, yeah, I, I, I support that. Right. They're not going to do it. So we don't really quite know. We, right. we uh, and we should be way far, further along. I know Chris is going to you know, give me the stats and tell me, you know, this and that and all that other stuff. I got it, Chris. I got what you're saying. Uh, but I, I want to end on a, a note that I think is important. And I started uh, the program and black women have been historically disrespected. Mm. And for us to have a vice president who's an, who's a black woman uh, on the ticket and we try to find out that we don't like her shoes. Uh, we don't like the fact that she locked up my second, third cousin for, you know, having a pound of uh, cocaine. 
that he shouldn't have and he's locked up and now I'm mad that she locked him up. That's crazy, right? But what's more crazy is when I hear reporters, uh, people that are journalists and people that have been in the business for a long time, use the code words like safe or use the code word like qualified. And uh, I sat back and I remember someone asked me, he said, oh, you know, is she qualified? You know, is she really qualified to run? And this was the same person who asked me to raise money for Mayor Pete, right? Mayor Pete, uh, who was supposed to be the next JFK, was, was the mayor of a city that was smaller than Ward 8 in Washington, D.C. And, mm -hmm. and yet they're asking me about her qualification. So, you know, we have to, this is the moment. This is the time. For those that are 18, for those that are 19, for those that are 25, so those that might not understand and might be disappointed that she locked 1,500 people up for weed, right? Now weed is legal and all these people smoking weed, and they're like, how'd you lock these people up for weed? I hear you. I hear the people who, have a un who don't understand her real background, don't understand her family fight and struggle and fighting for civil rights all over the world and in the United States, and they don't get to see that part of it. I got it. But we all have a mom, we all have an aunt, we all have a sister, many of us. And we know historically black women have been abused and mistreated. This is our moment to step up and say that we will no longer allow black women to be disrespected on a national stage, on a national spotlight, when she's clearly qualified, when she's clearly talented, when she clearly has demonstrated already that she's well ready and able to do the job today and to do the job tomorrow. So that's just my two cents as it relates to uh, the education of our folks around her. You don't have to like her, but don't complain. Get out and vote. JR, thank you for, uh, good to have you on the show. Really appreciate you uh, uh, coming on. Always like to get you back again to get your thoughts. Good to be with you, my brother. It's really good seeing you. I appreciate this. Yeah. Absolutely. And Chris, always a, ple always a pleasure, Chris, to have you on the show. I, I know you still got a lot more to say, but we just don't have a lot of time and get you back on the show a another time. OK. And I feel celebrated. Thank you so much for that great ending. Yeah, I Absolutely. If it's always real talk, you know, it's going to be real. Hey, folks. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get everybody on every. Will there be black? black uh backlash right um we saw that with obama yeah. when black I'm folks is running around talking about this their country this their president we taking over the whole country we saw what took place right i mean people right. who te who typically might have stayed with obama said no this is going too far right yeah. um no. are we going is will there be a black a black backlash based on the fact that we're tearing down statues that have been here for hundreds of years mm -hmm. uh we're you know people are protesting in the streets people are now saying if you say anything about black people you're going to get fired you're not going to have a job mm -hmm. uh you know your career is going to be taken away it's going to be gone to the fact that you know now we got a black woman as the vice president uh, vp when clearly suburban uh or we mm -hmm. folks in the suburban white women uh, are needed to actually win back the White House. Mm -hmm. All yeah. of those are facts. Yeah, no, I mean, think about it. A, a black woman, if things hold true and they win, the Democrats win, a black woman will make it to the White House quicker than a white woman. I mean... That was a big I'm, issue. That was that's a like, huge, huge issue. This, the uh, racism uh, from Warren... Black, black man, happened. black woman, white man, white woman. Mm -hmm. After this, the white woman will have been the one who's never been to the White House. That's the last one to the party. That's going to be interesting. So there may be some that, backlash. So my question I have for the question I have for for Chris is Chris, you know, we're all celebrating now. This should be an easy takedown. This should be an easy victory given what's in front of us and what's taking place and where America is. But do you think that there are going to be some out there that are quietly, even though they might not like this president? might still go in that voting booth and say, you know what? I'm going to vote for him. Not because I like him, because he's who, he's who he is. And, and I, I see a shift that I'm not quite ready for right now. So I, you know me, I like to monitor the numbers, look at the scenes, talk. I get to drive home to 
my husband's face in Georgia. I looked for yard signs all over the place. That was something they said. You, you, you've run for council. You've won. Did people argue that whether yard signs have value? They have some value because they tell you at least. A story. Hey, Chris, they have they have no value in two thousand twenty. You're not going to find anyone unless they're diehard Trump people. They're going to put up a Trump sign. People are embarrassed to say they support the president. So I, say, I don't see any. I don't see the yard signs I used to see when I went to North Carolina. You don't see them. For Trump, when I went to Virginia, I didn't Chris, see them for Chris, Trump. you sound like you sound like those deep Democrats. Democrats not winning North Carolina or South Carolina or Alabama. It's not happening. Wake I'm up! Gonna, I'm gonna be there for Jamie Harris for the last week in October. So even though I I know what the numbers say that it's gonna be difficult, and if I was on the outside and if it was somebody else besides Jamie, um, somebody I've like come up in CBC with. Maybe I'll agree with you that no, we can't win no, South. Hold up. I support but Jamie. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to claim it because he's my friend. He has great numbers. He's been breaking fundraising. He's keeping the polling at least close. And I, but I know, and as you know, if, if you're winning for the first time, you actually have to be a little ahead because that they're going to be able to pull it back if you're cl- keeping it close. But I'm going to be a fool. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to be there from October. Well, well, hold, hold up, Chris. Hold up, Chris. I support Jamie. And I think Jamie still has a path to victory. I just don't know if they're going to go in there and vote for Jamie and vote for Biden and Harris. Oh, no, I'm not yeah. sure about that. They yeah. might go in there still. I'm talking about, I don't want to talk about Jamie. I think Jamie has a, still an opportunity to win. I'm just wondering if, some, if they're going to go in there and vote for Jamie and vote for Biden and not vote for no. Trump and vote for Jamie. <laughs> I, I'll say no. I'll, I, I know that. They're, they're going to split ticket. If Jamie does win, they're going to vote for uh, or are they going to leave it blank? They're going to vote for Jamie, and they're going to leave it blank, and Trump will win the okay. way he won Georgia, about only about five or four points in South Carolina. Now watch this. Pennsylvania. Mm. I think we got that. See, I, I, I'm, this, fracking, always, hey, this fracking is an issue. Story of yeah. This fracking yeah. is an issue. Do not sleep on this fracking issue. It's, 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 it's it the is, heart and soul of how people live. Exactly. And that's why they didn't go with Hillary Clinton in 2016. They are very salty to say union members, Layuna and the, the trade unions are usually different. They vote sometimes secretly with Republicans, but nothing that they have prom- Trump has promised them, they have been able to go to the bank on. And they have gotten um, undermined with um, car check. They have gotten undermined with some of these trade policies, they they were th- seated at the table the day after he won, and they have seen nothing of support for the last four years. They we there was no way Hillary Clinton could have lost Pennsylvania if we had the unions in our back. They didn't have our back then. I think they they're back with us now. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think that Trump has a four year record of not producing. He made a lot of promises. Not just in Western Pennsylvania, but there's, I mean, he's, his, the action or the result doesn't necessarily always, has not matched up with what he's promised. So, but Frack, he's smart because fracking is the first thing that came out of his mouth the other day. And the economy's bad, but um, fracking, in any one instance, for Western Pennsylvania for sure. So, I mean, that's what makes the um, getting out the African American vote, you know, Eastern Pennsylvania is so critical in the Philadelphia and the suburbs and so on and so forth. So, um, but to your point, you. you're right. I will agree with you this too. Um, signs, you know, uh, Squire, Pat Boggs, many firms, not just Squire. A lot of folks come, you know, in, who who have um, <laughs> law degrees from some of the greatest, some great schools. Who, who, um, you know, who who dress a particular way. You would think, no, they wouldn't be. Um, they wouldn't fall in line or support someone who like a Trump. But I work with people who support Trump, who are going to vote for Trump. And that's not just at my firm. That's at a lot of these firms. Every, every firm, every major firm across the city and across the nation are going to go in because they're going to vote their interest because they benefited from the tax cuts. They benefit from some of the craziness that Trump proposes. So, you know, well, they're, they're looking at the stock hey, market. Look, that's why I like you, Brother Clark, because I know my good sister right here. She's, you know, she's on the Kool-Aid 100 percent. 
She's Not never going to jump off of it. She's, she's going to tell me that he's going to win everywhere. He's going to win in Ohio. He's going to win in Wisconsin. He's going to win in Nevada. And I'm just saying that, you know. Kamala Harris was announced. More than 15 captains of industry herald the pick. And the stock market stayed steady. Usually the it goes up and down. It stayed steady. It's not. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are not Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And they don't, people do not fear that they're going to do some, or even propose some radical, unpending European type socialist that failed over there. We, oh, they can serve their financial interests in another way, not necessarily the tax way, of course. It, um, I don't think anybody right here where any of the Democratic Party stuff fits our financial interests. Every well, I'm not rich, but it's I'm like two seconds away from getting my taxes raised. But we still vote with the party because there's certain other elements that we are looking forward to seeing. So let me ask you, let me so Chris, let me ask you a question. Given that, right, which you laid out that both Joe Biden and uh, Senator Harris are moderates and they're not to the left. So can you explain to me how those that are progressive where do they see themselves in this ticket? There's a beautiful political article right now where they said um, a good number of progressives are happy, but they're not they're not ecstatic. They see Kamala as not their Warren or the Karen Bass, but they're at least happy that she's not Susan Rice or Amy Klobuchar. And that's actual quote. And I, I'm like, that's the best sweet spot you could possibly be with that you you let me be honest with you if they had gotten elizabeth warren obviously there's some states we would have had to kiss off forever but they still would have been upset i i follow them i track their articles i read their tweets i read the blog postings um i love the progressive left i consider myself of of their birth i came into politics like you said if you're if you're not a liberal, like when you're young, you have no heart. If you're not, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at this juncture for where they are, they are kind of a scattered um, group. So it's you're going to get uh, the fact that we can get a good majority. At least the polling tells us we have between 85 to 90 percent of them. I'm going to consider it a win because you're I don't think. Even Bernie himself in the incarnation is going to make them happy. Well, they're, I they're I, look, I'll tell you this, though. I'll tell you this. All your polling, all your numbers, everything <laughs> that you tell me says that this is a wipeout and, you know, don't worry about it. So it's going to be all yeah. good. Hey, you know uh, why we don't say that? You know why we don't? Because um, if you, everybody thinks it's a wipeout, some people don't go to vote. They feel like they have the liberty to vote third party, they have the liberty to stay home. And I think there was a little bit too much of that in 2016. Everybody said, Hillary's got it, Hillary's got it. Mm. So people went and went, oh, well, I want th more third party conversations, so I'm gonna vote for Jill Stein. They were, in, they were living in Pennsylvania, they were living in North Carolina and thinking about voting for Jill Stein? No, we wanna make sure everybody knows we can, we're, even if the poll said we're 10 points up, People need to know we're about an inch away from losing. All right, Chris, we're going to find out. The good thing, good thing about this for all of us is that we, we shall soon see. That's the good thing about it. It's not going to take a long time. Not going to be a year. You know, we got less than, what, 70 days, something like that. It's going to be real soon. We'll figure out what it was. I like the fact that we have uh, JR. Like you said, there are a lot of people you work with. There are a lot of people in your industry. And right now, what they care about is people vote for their interest. The interest is, you know, not morality, right? The interest is, you know, what is going to happen to my pocketbook? And am I going to be safe? I think the Democrats, Chris, are playing it. Right. They're trying to figure out if they can use this epidemic, this virus, the handling of this virus as a way to say, is that enough? But for all those people out there on the right who say that, you know, they want to cut spending and they say that, hey, you know, we need to end all the welfare. Well, everyone's on welfare. And the biggest recipient of it is our banks and our businesses because they're all getting bailed out right now. And everyone has got a check. They're getting government assistance. Might not be the cheese, right? Might not be the cheese that we used to get when I was a little kid. But they are getting something called government assistance. A whole bunch of people on welfare right now. And it's, and nobody wants to talk about that, right? Nobody wants to talk about that right now. But I want to thank both of you for being coming on the show. 
Always a pleasure having you. Um, look forward to getting you both back. If it's always real talk, you know it's going to be real. Love you, brothers. Great right, talk. Love you too, brother.